This man is one of the most highly acclaimed and influential comic book writers of all time. He truly is an advocate for the growth, transformation, and for the power of ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, the true rock star of comics, Mr. Grant Moore. Kind of you, I can't express how much that means to me in words, so I'll do it in the form of dance. To me, it just comes down to a very simple equation, is that life plus significance equals magic. Grant Morrison is the most popular and the most successful comic book writer of his generation, but he's also the most controversial. You know, he, he'd get involved in, in these adventures that just seemed so absurd and fictional almost. Art and writing are magical things. I don't know how much of it what you hear about him as myth and, what, and what's reality. Everybody wants to hear the, the crazy stories about him. And maybe the guy walks around his house and like takes out the garbage in a silver suit, but I sort of doubt it. I'm not going there. The, the, the magic stuff. When you hang out with Grant, you, you just get like the fucking download. I went up to him drunk and in tears and basically told him that he had changed my life. And he does have the image, the glamour, this projects a certain aura. Because he's iconic, just visually. He's always had very strong interests in a lot of weird shit. When he shook my hand and um, he has these intense laser eyes and his big voice, I was just like, wow. It almost feels like he's above all of us, looking down at everything and can see the whole. We, as three-dimensional entities, were interacting with a two-dimensional plane. And the only guy who knows how to draw hypertime on the back of a napkin. What you have to remember about Grant is that his greatest creation in a lot of ways is himself. So it's never going to be me, it's never, you'll never get it, you know, and you'll never know, and whatever you think I am, that's what I'm not. I grew up as a kid in a, a fairly poor part of Scotland, in Glasgow. My father had been a soldier in World War II. He'd been started as a soldier and then he became a pacifist. He was a big man, a strong man. He had a moustache, looked a bit like Stalin. Uh, <laughs> he was a character. But I'd been up at my grandmother's and one of the last steam trains that ever went on, on the rails in Scotland came roaring past me. My dad saw me like, rooted to the ground apparently from the window and ran down and scooped me up. And he said my, the terror that, that was on my face and the noise that I was experiencing is why he got really into the whole nuclear war thing, the whole disarmament thing, because he'd seen how frightened I was and the sound, and he, to him it was the sound of bombs, you know, he'd lived through in the war. He was a political man, he was very political, very driven, do you know what I mean, by the causes. You know, my dad's stuff was all anti-nuclear nightmare brochures, you know, pictures of cities burned out and screaming skeletons and nuclear fallout. Yeah, but I was kind of used as a, a decoy where my dad would go in and he'd, he'd kick balls over fences and we'd climb in and he'd pretend that his son was looking for his ball while he would take photographs of these underground nuclear bases. So I saw some really strange stuff when I was a kid that was like, you know, like prisoner style things where you'd look down a long tunnel into a hillside and there's little men in carts driving past. Over here to our left, even though we can't really point the camera at it, 
is RNAS Coolport, which is the home of the Trident missile defence system. This is the place where my, my dad used to take me when he was doing all his protest stuff. And he actually got into the, the, the underground base right over there. And they had things like they had everyone's coffin, cardboard coffins piled up on the wall. And it was the idea that when the nuclear war came, all the civil servants would have four minutes to rush to these hidden shelters. And from there, they would sharpen their pencils and start the world up again. You know, it was insane. The idea that they even believed this could happen. But they actually had stacks of coffins, cardboard coffins, that could be folded out. And they would everyone's names printed on them from the electoral register. So they were just waiting for us all to die.